Hello class, my name is Alex Miller and I will be your Physics 2 instructor this quarter. And so on the first day of class, I plan to delve right into chapter 10, which deals with rotational dynamics. And so you should have covered chapter 9 last quarter in Physics 1. In chapter 9, you discussed, you know, rotation of rigid bodies. Now, since both of these chapters deal with rotation, it'll be extra important that you rem remember the material from chapter 9. So I thought it would be helpful if I, if I did a little review of chapter 9 and posted this video so you can look at it, make sure we're all starting out the quarter on the same page, and we're ready to learn some rotational dynamics. All right, so rigid body rotation. So rigid body rotation is sort of nice because you're studying objects that simply rotate together. So instead of having maybe some wobbly object where different parts are rotating with different velocities at different times, you know, this is just an approximation where the whole body rotates with simply one angular velocity all together. All right, so we could consider, for instance, some, you know, weird shape like this, right? And let's say it's rotating about this point. So we have some axis here. Of course, it's very important to always remember when you're considering rotation that it has to be rotating about some axis. So you always have to remember, keep in the back of your mind, which axis you are considering for which problem. Often this will simply be the center of mass of the body, but often it's not. Um, it can be any random point that you, you want to consider. So let's say this guy is rotating like this. Um, so the first sort of quantity that you might want to consider is the angular velocity, which is often denoted by an omega. Right, so if we have some point here with some angular position theta, then omega is simply the time derivative of theta. Right, so it is the change in the angle over time. Now you'll notice that I wrote a little arrow over the omega here, and that's because this is a vector, of course. And so on the right-hand side, we also need a vector quantity. And so if you recall, you simply find the direction omega by using the right-hand rule. So let's say in these coordinates, that might be the z-hat direction, uh, for instance. Uh, all right, so you could consider objects that are rotating with a constant angular velocity, or you could also consider objects that have some angular acceleration. So this is often denoted by alpha, and it is simply the time derivative of omega or similarly, the second time derivative of theta with respect to time, which again might be in the z-hat or minus z-hat direction. Um, all right, so what you'll start to notice and hopefully, hopefully you've noticed before is that when you're moving to talking about rotational as opposed to linear motion, there's sort of an analog for each quantity. You have linear velocity, you have rotational velocity, you have linear acceleration, you have angular acceleration. So the next thing that, that you could consider is when you have constant angular acceleration. So you just have some alpha that is constant, but then of course omega is changing in time. So for constant, alpha. If you recall when you did linear motion, you could start with constant linear acceleration and this led to a set of kinematic equations. And we have a similar set when we're considering angular constant acceleration. And you would find that, okay, so I'll consider one component at a time. So let's consider the z component of the, the angular velocity as a function of time is simply given by this little knot here denoting that this is the initial angular velocity plus alpha around the z-axis times time, where alpha here again is, is a constant value. We're considering constant angular acceleration. So the next thing you could consider is, let's say, the position, the angular position about the z-axis as a function of time. And this is given by, again, its initial uh, angular position plus uh, its initial, uh, sorry, sort of works, uh, its initial velocity 
times time, plus again that constant angular acceleration times t squared over two. And then the final one you might wanna consider. So this would be the case if you aren't given any information about the time. So you don't want an expression in terms of time. Then you have omega z squared as a function of time is equal to, again, it's a initial angular velocity squared plus two times that constant angular acceleration times the changing angle minus the initial angle. All right, so these are sort of three different uh, ways you could write your kinematic equations for constant angular acceleration. Again, it's very important to remember this is only for constant alpha. If you have something where your forces are changing in time, these equations won't, won't apply anymore. And again, you can rewrite these in any, ways you, any way you want. This is just sort of some standard ways that, that we write them. So the next thing you should have learned about is moment of inertia, also called rotational inertia. So I'll call this rotational inertia. And this is often denoted by the letter I. All right, so, you know, when you were considering linear uh, motion, you know that an object's mass tells you about its resistance to accelerate, its a resistance to change. And rotational inertia similarly tells you about an object's resistance to rotate or change the way it's rotating. And instead of just being determined by an object's mass, this depends on the shape of the objects, the distribution of its mass. And in particular, for objects where the mass is distributed further from the axis of rotation, then it's going to resist that change more than objects where if you have some tight little dense ball, that'll rotate really easily. So for instance, take this pen in my hand. We could consider, for instance, its rotational inertia about its center of mass. Now, that's actually ambiguous. You need to also say the direction of the axis that you're considering. So let's say the center of mass is about here in the middle, and let's take the axis going directly through the middle of the pen. So we're rotating sort of like this, right? And this is pretty easy. You know, the rotational inertia about this axis, where the axis is going through the middle of the pen, is pretty small. On the other hand, we could consider an axis also through the center of mass, but perpendicular to the length of the pen. So now we have an object that's rotating like this, and the mass is distributed further from the axis of rotation. This is going to be harder. It's going to have a higher rotational inertia or moment of inertia. And then finally, you could consider rotation about an axis that's not the center of mass. So for instance, the end of the pen. So you could have something like this, and now the mass is distributed even further from the axis of rotation, i is going to be an even higher number. So we see that this can be found by integrating the distance times the tiny little mass element. So again, we see this depends on r, which is the distance from your axis of rotation to your mass element. And so we see that the further the mass is distributed from your axis of rotation, the greater i is going to be. So now there's a very important theorem in computing the rotational inertia, and this is called the parallel axis theorem. So this is useful if you know the moment of inertia about the center of mass, or if it's something that's easy to compute. And what it tells you is the moment of inertia about an axis which is parallel to your original axis is given by the moment of inertia about the center of mass plus the total mass times the distance between the two axes squared. So for instance, if we knew the rotational inertia about this axis um, through the center of mass, then we could find the rotational inertia about the end of the pen by simply adding um, the total mass times the distance between the two, which is just the length of the pen over two. So this would be so, you know, for rigid rods, for instance, you know, similar to this pen, this is a really helpful way of computing through any axis where, again, your new axis needs to be parallel to your original axis, thus the name parallel axis theorem.
All right, so we're almost getting to the end. So the next thing you might want to consider, so we know that for an object to be rotating, it must be accelerating. And I mean that it must have some linear acceleration. So we have, um, you know, some object going around, some particle going around in a circle. Um, in order for it to be changing directions, then you know that it must have some, some acceleration that is causing it to change direction. So for instance, for uniform circular motion, um, we know that, that there must be some acceleration on this particle moving in a circle directly towards the center of the circle, which we'll call A rad. So this is the acceleration keeping the particle moving in a circle. And this is simply given by, so A rad is given by V squared over R. So that would be the tangential velocity. Oh, sorry, not over two, over R. V squared over R, or equivalently, omega squared times R, where again, R is the radius of the circle. So this is the expression for the linear acceleration that keeps an object moving in a circle. All right, and then finally, um, you might want to relate, so you might want to relate a tangential, so the linear acceleration, which is tangential to the direction of uh, motion, to um, uh, the, the angular acceleration of an object. So we know if this guy is going around, but, but uh, has some angular acceleration, you might want to relate these two quantities to each other. And this is simply given by a tangential is just alpha, again, times r, which is the radius of the circle again. All right, so I think those were most of the basic concepts from chapter nine. Uh, hopefully they were all familiar to you. If not, maybe take a little time, go back, look through your old notes or some of your old problems. Make sure you remember how to do all of these things before the first day of class, um, because in problems in the future, you'll be using new concepts as well as these concepts in order to get to the final answer. So you'll need to know all of it. So I'm really looking forward to learning some physics with all of these this quarter. Um, see you on the first day of class. Thanks.